Hi, I'm Katie Crane, and this is the Pilates Lounge. Hey there, friends. This is Katie Crane, the Pilates professional. Welcome to the Pilates Lounge. Today's episode, I am talking all about stress. And in fact, I'm going to talk about the physicality of stress. But before we get going, I just want to give you a heads up that I've got three beautiful roosters competing for about 20 chickens in my backyard on my property. And they are literally below this room right now, singing out and trying to outdo each other in the hope that they're going to win the feather of their handmaiden. (laughs) So I know throughout this episode, you're going to be listening to my roosters and that's cool. This is how I roll. This is how I live. And you know what? The fact that I've got roosters is is one of the reasons that has taken me so long to get started on this podcast. And I've tried all sorts of things to get rid of the sound of these beautiful birds in the background to no avail. So now you're just going to have to pretend that you're sitting on my deck with a cup of coffee listening to me in the reel and my roosters are right there with you. (laughs) It seems to be an ongoing theme because the time of day that I'm choosing to record often coincides with the time of day that these guys start to call out to the girls. In any case, I'm not going to stress about it. (laughs) In fact, I can tell you now, this has caused much stress in my life thinking about how to get how to deal with these damn roosters without getting rid of them because I do love them. If you've never had a rooster in your backyard, they are the most beautiful looking birds. Some of their feathers are so magnificent and they really do walk around our property like they're models on a catwalk. So I don't want to get rid of them, but I have literally pulled my hair out trying to stop them from crowing at the times when I'm doing this podcast and it just so happens that now I'm going to be giving you ideas of what you can do in studio when some of your clients are dealing with these stressful situations. Maybe it's roosters, maybe it's not. But today I'm going to talk about what stress is, how we might be feeling stress in the body physically and emotionally and what it is that we might be able to do at home for ourselves to to mitigate the experience of stress, but also if you're a Pilates instructor or Pilates professional, some ideas of what you might be able to be doing in studio to create a sense of calm in the classes that you're teaching. Stress or the feeling of stress is one of the biggest issues that we see in the studio when we're working with somebody who is in physical pain. And pain is, in fact, a stressful experience as it is. In fact, if you have ever, ever dealt with yourself or if you work with clients who live in chronic pain, so chronic pain would be considered pain that is more than about three months old. So we have acute pain. It's acute pain, say, I hurt my knee, I damage a ligament, immediately it's painful and it's painful until the healing process has happened and then I'm no longer in pain. Chronic pain is sustained pain. It's pain that continues to go on even though physically the body should have healed itself by now, even though maybe that the injury that was initially causing the pain is no longer present or a person who's living with a disease or a condition that causes them pain, ongoing pain, then that could be considered chronic pain. The thing with pain, when it's long-standing, it's not even the physical experience that people really want to get away from. It's the psychological experience. Pain really can be psychologically debilitating. And while this episode is not on pain, there will definitely be an episode on pain. I just want to put that out there 
uh, that if you are one of those people who is either living with chronic pain or you're working with people with chronic pain, sometimes we need to create a safe space, a safe working environment, a safe living environment for us to be able to deal with the psychological aspect of living with that. The pain is definitely a stress. Absolutely. Okay. What is stress? How many times have you heard someone say, don't stress about it, or why are you so stressed out, or what are you stressing about? There's two types of stress, actual stress or real stress and perceived stress. No one is worse or better than the other. No, neither perceived stress nor real stress is trumps. Both end up with the same experience in the brain and in the body. But I guess stress could be explained as an event or a situation that creates an upturn of the stress responses in your body. So what I mean by a real stress or an actual stress and a perceived stress is this. A real stress would be you've had an argument with your partner or with with somebody in your home and you're feeling very angry and very upset and potentially threatened by that. That is a real stress. You've lost your car keys and you're going to be late for work and you know that you're going to end up getting a hounding from the person that you work for. That is a real stress. Getting stuck at the traffic lights and knowing again that you're going to be late for something or you've got an appointment that you're never going to make it to, that's a real stress. Having an accident and hurting yourself, that is a real stress. Compared to a perceived stress, walking down the street, say it's night time, and you've been told over and over again by your parents as you were growing up that walking down the street at night time is dangerous. Even though there's nobody around you, there's not a person in sight, but your brain has a relationship to the activity that you're doing and a story that you've been told. And so your brain and your body perceives you to be in a stressful situation. That's a perceived stress or a perceived threat. Another perceived threat may be your sister and her husband have been fighting all the time and your sister keeps telling you how upset she is and how sad she is and how difficult it is to live with her husband at the moment. It's not your problem. So that's a perceived stress. But we take on these stresses from our environment, from around us. So either it's a story that we've been told and then we relate it to an activity that we're doing at the time, even though that in that moment it's you're not threatened, or we're taking on other people's issues, other people's experiences, and we are experiencing them in our body, in our composition, as if they are our own. Because the thing is with the body and with the brain, we the brain actually cannot discern what is real and what is not real. It's quite amazing. And there's positives and negatives to that. And let, let me give you an example. If you're watching Jurassic Park, if we know that Jurassic Park is not a real film. We know that the dinosaurs are not real, but when the dinosaur is chasing somebody in their car, as happens in the movie, then we start to get quite excited on the inside, right? Our heart starts to race. Maybe you start to sweat a little bit. Your eyes start to get bigger. Your mouth might start to dry out. All these things happen in the body as if you're actually in the moment in that movie, Your brain does not recognize that you're watching a movie. All your brain recognizes is that there is a perceived threat, a perceived stress in front of you in the moment. And physiologically, all of the things are going to start happening in your body as if you were actually under threat. So if we put that into context of think of all of the things that we watch on television, that we see on a screen, whether it's on on our phone, on the iPad, in advertising, we're walking through a big city, anything, anything that our eyes take in, the brain perceives that to be true. What do you think is happening in your body if you're watching mainstream media news every night? You think your body's going to end up with these feel-good hormones coursing through it, or is your body going to end up with 
adrenaline and cortisol, which are the two stress hormones coursing through it. Well, I can tell you now, <laughs> in case you're wondering, your body's going to end up with stress hormones coursing through it if you are watching over and over again something on the screen that is stressing you out. I'm not going to go there right now, but a couple of years ago, think about what was happening on TV over and over and over again every single day. And it was not just on television, but everywhere you went, it was in your face. There was a story getting being told by the entire to the entire world at the same time, which was putting a lot of people into a very, very stressful situation or a very a continual feeling of stress, which was a perceived threat. Happens all the time. Did you know, as a side note, that that's one of the greatest tools in marketing is being able to tap into your fear state, is being able to tap into your primal stress response. Think about that. Think about all of those marketing messages out there that are tapping into that response. But they're not real threats. They're not things that are really going to get you, but your body does not know the difference. So that's just one perceived threat or one perceived stress. It doesn't matter whether or not it's real. Your body is responding with a stress response compared to, say, you fall over, you hurt yourself, stress response. Or if you are getting chased for real down the dark alleyway, stress response, that's a real threat. That's a real stress. So there's two. There's those two different ones. It's important that we understand the difference. It's also important that we understand that the brain does not know the difference. All right. So what happens when we have this experience of either a real or a perceived stress? What does happen in the body? The brain actually speaks to the body. And the brain and the body are always speaking to each other. There's always messages coming from the body to the brain and then back down to the body, always. And part of that is as movement educators, we understand that as our proprioceptors. So our proprioceptors live in between our joints and our ligaments and they give feedback from our external experience, from our external world by touching things and then they would send messages to the brain for the brain then to send a message back down to the body for the body to act. For example, I put my hand on a hot stove plate and that proprioceptor, those messengers, send a very, very fast message to the brain. Oh, that is hot. You're going to burn your hand. And then the brain quickly sends a message back down to the hand to take, take the hand off of the hot plate. So our body is always sending messages to the brain. But the brain's a funny thing. And if the body is not sending those messages, then the brain's pretty good at making things up. Because the brain, I think of the brain like a catalogue. Every single experience in your life, and that includes real experience, but also perceived experience, movies you watch, things you watch on TV, things around you, the music you listen to, the books you read, all of those sorts of things. Your brain catalogues all of those experiences. And then your brain is constantly sifting through that catalogue of experiences to then act at the drop of a hat. So if your brain perceives that you are under threat, then your brain will act and send messages to the body, to the nervous system, to make sure that you can get out of the way of that threat. So it's actually a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus actually communicates to the rest of the body through what's called the autonomic nervous system. And that governs involuntary actions like uh, breathing and heartbeat. So when you're stressed out, your heartbeat will elevate, your breathing would elevate, maybe you'll start perspiring, maybe your eyes would dilate. Apparently you can see better in the dark when you're very, very at that heightened state of stress. And basically your body is getting ready to fight or flight in response to the brain giving the body this information that you need to deal with some, with some sort of perceived threat. So you get a surge of energy to confront that perceived threat. Now that stress signal is coordinated through the nervous system and through neurotransmitters in the form of adrenaline. 
So you've probably heard of adrenaline. Adrenaline is the hormone that starts coursing through the body when you're in a state of perceived threat so that you can get out of the way quickly, right? And it's like a, it's like an accelerator. And it means that you say if you were getting chased somebody or if you were getting got, going to be attacked or whatever or a bus was going to run you over, then you would have time to get out of the way quickly. That's adrenaline. Super important, actually keeps us alive. That's its job in any case. Mm -hmm. But then we have cortisol. So cortisol is more like our long-term stress response as well. Cortisol often has a bad name. And I want to be the person who lets you know the cortisol is an amazing hormone in your body and it actually plays a really <laughs> integral role in your every day. My puppy dogs are sitting under my feet and they've decided to start playing. They're so naughty. All right, I'm trying to pull them apart while I'm talking. So cortisol often gets a really bad name, but let's have a look at cortisol and figure out together whether or not we should be celebrating cortisol or whether or not we're going to put a black mark next to it. Cortisol is actually produced in the adrenal glands. A little bit of anatomy 101, the adrenal glands sit just on top of the kidneys and this is where this cortisol is produced and it's one of our, one of our immediate and long-term stress responses. What I mean by that is it's actually one of our primal functions is what we call the waking response. So cortisol is what actually wakes us up in the morning. We think that what wakes us up in the morning is needing to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I've heard it. I've heard it many, many times. No, it's cortisol that wakes us up and then we need to go to the bathroom because actually the urge to go to the bathroom shuts down when we're asleep. So cortisol will wake us up first. I know. All of you out there that wake up every night in the middle of the night and need to go to the bathroom and you think that that's what is waking you up, it's most often cortisol. So it's most often that your waking response is maybe a little bit wound up or a little bit messed up, should I say, or that your liver is not functioning optimally. But that's another story completely. I'm not going to go into it. So cortisol wakes us up in the morning, gets us motivated to get on about our day. Cortisol is the first stage of healing. So if you have an injury and you end up with inflammation around the injury, which is a part of your healing phase, there's cortisol that starts that healing, that inflammatory response. So with that in mind, if we have cortisol being produced too long, too often, then we remain in an inflamed state. And it's a little bit of a misnomer with cortisol. Like pe People will often say, oh, my cortisol is too high. I've got too much cortisol. It's not really how it works. What happens is you have too much stress. So whether it's perceived stress or real stress, you have too much stress. Your body will then produce cortisol for your body to be able to deal with that stress. And then if you don't come out of that stressful experience before the next stressful experience, then your body's going to have to increase the base level of the cortisol response. So if you are somebody who lives in a very stressed environment, maybe you're stressed at home, relationship issues, work issues, teenagers not telling you where they're going in the middle of the night, sister having problems with her husband, neighbor playing music at all hours of the night, late for work because you can't find your keys. So you've got this accumulation of stress in your life. It's not that you're producing too much cortisol. It's that your base level for cortisol has elevated because you live in this high stress environment and then your body just literally cannot keep up with that. So eventually either your body will struggle to produce all of that cortisol or you'll have some sort of nervous breakdown or you'll get very sick. That is just that is the body's response to long-term stress. Potentially you end up with some autoimmune cancer, MS, all, all sorts of things can be attributed to long-term stress. So what does that mean? Could we go live on a beach and, and sip on coconut 
pina coladas all day long? Is that going to help? Is that going to sort our issues out? Maybe short term, go on a holiday. Quite often, your you, your body will need will let you know. A lot of the time, I need time out. I need to go on a holiday. But if we live in this excessively stressful environment all the time, and then just every now and then take one week off and go on a holiday, it's not really fixing the problem. It's probably alleviating some of the stress intermittently, but it's more like a band aid approach. And when it comes to stress, the thing is, it's never just one thing. So it may be all those emotional things that are happening in our life, all the things that tick us off, all the things that make us upset, make us angry, they're all stresses in our life. But it might also be the food that we're eating or the way that we are eating is not conducive to being healthy. It may be that we're on a lot of medications long term that can actually be stressful on the body. It may be that you've got an injury and then on top of that injury, you've already got another injury. So maybe you've got almost like a stacking of injuries and your body's struggling to overcome this. So they're also all stresses that increase inflammation in the body. And then we add them on with all the emotional stresses, very, very difficult for the body to get out of that unless we change things that we're doing on a daily basis. And this, I believe, is really where Pilates comes into it. This is the magic of Pilates. When somebody comes into our studio, one of the first things that, that we always do, that I always do, is really observe the person when they come in. How are they moving? How are they walking? How are they putting their bag down? How are they greeting other people? Are they looking at other people in the eye? Are they looking down at the floor? Are they engrossed in their phone or do they have their headphones on? Are they being a part of their current surroundings or are they really shutting off from everything around them? People that are not feeling stressed tend to, in a social situation, in a community situation, will tend to be more engaged. People that are stressed will tend to busy, that's in inverted commas, because guess what? We're all busy. <laughs> no one person is any busier than the next person, but there are still certain social graces of, of, of saying hello to somebody when you walk in a room, of putting your phone away, of taking your pods, ear pods out of your ears. If somebody is not doing that, then potentially they're feeling stressed. And sometimes it's a way, it's a defense mechanism. Then once I've observed my people as they walk in the room and I've greeted them with a smile on my dial, I get them to start moving in a way that they want to move. So the way that we work in studio is we'll invite people in, say hello. And when we've seen people a few times, we generally give them some home program. I'm a big believer that the body is designed to move. So that means the body is designed to move every single day. And in fact, the body is designed to move every single day much more than what is designed not to move every single day. But the mass population doesn't necessarily have a job like that of a Pilates right. professional. And quite often they're sitting down or they're moving repetitively for long periods of time. And so... When we learn about somebody in the studio, what is it that you do on a daily basis, then we start to give them some homework that may, I think about unwinding. So maybe it unwinds them from that repetitive movement. Maybe it opens them up, stretches them out, stretch in inverted commas. I think that I've already spoken about that in one of my other podcasts that we do not stretch muscle, we change the shape of muscle, but that's okay. We stretch them out anyway because that's the language that they use. And I really give people a little bit of time to themselves to get themselves sorted before I step into their space. Now, this can be done whether you're doing a group class and everybody's doing those exercises together. I guess it might be a bit more of a generic class or if you're working one-on-one -on -one with people. You can give people a little bit of space, a little bit of time, to figure out what feels good. And sometimes people do need a little bit of guidance and that's okay. Maybe in a group class, I might invite the class to do a couple of standing roll downs and really talk them through 
feeling their feet grounded into the floor, recognizing any tightness that they might have in their body and using their breath to let that tightness go before they come back up to standing. And then if we do another standing roll down, maybe I'd give them a few different options. If you want to sway your trunk side to side, if you want to soften into the knees or straighten the legs. So I'd, I might talk the group through it, but I'd just give them options to start to feel into their body. Because one of the beauties of Pilates, one of the magical components of Pilates is, of course, one of the principles, which is focus. When we take time to focus on what we're doing, or you could think of it as mindfulness, when we take time to perform exercises mindfully, we come into the body. So then those perceived threats, especially the sister arguing with her husband, having been late for work, all those perceived threats, those perceived stresses that were filling my head all day long. Sometimes if we bring mindfulness into our practice, then we're able to let those perceived threats go. And what a beautiful thing that is. It's almost like letting the weight of the world come away from your shoulders. And how often do we see somebody come into the studio and it literally looks like they are holding the world on their shoulders? Oh my word, some people's shoulders look like they literally have been holding the entire earth for many, many years, and it looks so uncomfortable. And I can only imagine what must be happening on the inside of that person. So as Pilates professionals, we have, we have this beautiful, insightful moment where we get to work with somebody in a way that it gives us a window, a real look into what it is that they're experiencing on the inside in an everyday pattern. Now, when I get people onto the machines, what I like to do is definitely guide people through. These are the exercises that we're going to be doing today. I've got a little bit of an idea, but I'm always looking for ways that I could alleviate any wound up tension. Things that I use to allow for that to happen is things like the chi ball, the chi ball or even a stability disc. So if we're doing footwork or feet and straps and popping that underneath the pelvis is a really nice way to alleviate some of that tension in the low back. If you're on the reformer, say doing footwork or feet and straps, sometimes I'll pop a couple of little soft balls just between the shoulder rests and the shoulders to give the person a little bit of a massage, but also a sense of space between the shoulders and the shoulder rests. But what happens when we start to give space or allow for space in the class and we start to talk somebody through this mindful movement of being able to focus on what it is that they're doing, of maybe bringing breath into the work, then we can tap into what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. So we have of the autonomic nervous system or of the central nervous system, we have two parts, the PNS, parasympathetic nervous system, and the SNS the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is the body's response to stress. So those are all those things like elevated heart rate, sweating, the eyes dilating, heart, I said elevated heart rate, but also elevated breath, maybe like breath goes faster. But also what happens when we're under stress, the body stops digesting. We stop digesting food. As women, we're not going to get pregnant. As men, we probably don't have a very good sperm count because think about it, if you're in a stressful situation and really the brain is all about survival and if your brain perceives that you're under threat, that you're under stress, then the brain is not going to allow the body to conceive. It just isn't going to happen. And it's really common when we work with women who bid on IVF or something and then they give up on the IVF. It hasn't worked anyway. Then they then they decide to take off and go on a 12-month holiday. They're going to leave their job and take off traveling. You know what happens then? So they get pregnant. And it happens because the body is no longer under threat. Also, digestion. We're not going to digest food when we're stressed out because the digestive system is almost on hold. Because again, a threat in in our primal living, back when we were hunters and gatherers, a threat may have been not eating for a few days or being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. Oh. So you're not going to be digesting food when that's happening. 
So the body slows down its digestive abilities. So then on the other side, the parasympathetic nervous system is things like meditation, rest, digest, heal, and recover. This happens when we are not in a state of perceived stress or in a stressful environment. So in the studio, not only is somebody coming to us for the physical benefits of loading up, of doing their Pilates class on a machine, loading up against the springs. We know that that is good for the muscles, for the joints, for the ligaments, for the bones. There's no doubt about it. But have we really, or have you really thought about the benefits of laying down on a machine and simply doing your footwork because your brain recognizes that laying down on a machine doing footwork is a safe thing for you to do. And in turn, When your brain starts to recognize that, you digest food better so you don't have gut problems, you don't have clogs in the colon, (laughs) you rest better, you go home and have a better night's sleep, you feel much more relaxed, the heart rate lowers, the body is able to heal from your injury. I cannot tell you how many times in my career somebody has told me that Pilates has saved their fill in the blank. Whether it's Pilates has saved me from my constant back pain that I had for years. Pilates fixed my shoulder injury. Pilates fixed my knee injury. Because of Pilates, I'm now able to run. Pilates saved my marriage. I've heard somebody say that to me before. When you get that type of feedback from people, you have to realize that it is not being on the machine doing the exercise. It is the entire experience of Pilates because, and I'm going to go back to them so often, because of the principles that we follow, concentration, flow, breath, control, precision, awareness, all of these beautiful attributes that Pilates offers somebody and gives them 50 minutes, an hour, however long your class is, that moment in time to come back to their body, to let go of the outdoor worries, of the outside worries. And breathe is one of the first things we learn when we're teaching Pilates is is breathing. And quite often somebody will say, when do I breathe? I'm not sure when I need to breathe right now. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when you breathe. Just every now and then, bring awareness to your breath. Make sure you are breathing, that you're not holding your breath. And that's all part of letting that stress go. Now, remember I said the the adrenal glands live on top of the kidneys, and I want to circle back around to that and why this is so important to understand, but also what I believe one of the reasons that Pilates helps with somebody who is under stress. So remember the adrenal glands, that's where cortisol is produced. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of the body sits on top of the kidneys. Of course, the kidneys are flushing the body out and the kidneys to work well need to be hydrated. Definitely water plays a role in making sure that the kidneys are working well. Especially in my country, in Australia, we are a coffee country. Coffee is a thing and alcohol is also a big thing. But if you're working with somebody who is a coffee drinker, alcohol drinker, I'm always encouraging people to drink water. For the adrenals to be working well, the kidneys must be working well too. And one of the ways that we can help the kidneys to work well is actually lay on the back. And in fact, laying on the back with the legs up the wall. So I want you to envision this right now. You're laying on the back on the floor and you've got your legs straight up against a wall. It feels really good. I think of it as almost creating some space between the kidneys and the adrenals. I have heard yoga instructors and somatic movement educators talk about it allowing for this, for this multi-directional movement. And if you imagine every cell in the body, every organ in the body all has this pulsating movement that happens, right, as blood runs through. And when we lay on the back, it allows for relationship to gravity changes. And so it allows for space to be between the kidneys and the adrenal glands for this pulsation to happen. So think of what we do in the Pilates studio 
where you're laying on your back with your legs in the air. There are so many opportunities for us right here, right now, to be considering all of those moments that we are nourishing the kidneys. And if the kidneys are nourished and the adrenals live on top of the kidneys, adrenals are happy. If the adrenals are happy, then the body is functioning better. Just to point it out to you, we could think footwork on the reformer, on the trap table, on the tower, feet in straps on any of the machines, supine arm work. So you're laying on your back with your hands in straps, anything that does that. So anything where you're laying on your back is going to help with that process. And have you ever considered this? The way that the reformer moves, it moves up and down. If you've never been on a reformer, it literally looks like a bed and it has little springs on it or, and it has a bar that you push out. So the bed itself is the carriage itself is on a frame and that carriage is moving up and down as you push your feet out. I want you to think for a moment of what that may remind you of, especially if you're a mother. To me, it makes me think of the rocking of the cradle or the swaying when I'm holding my baby in my arms. So I've got my baby in my arms and I'm swaying side to side. Or got baby in the pram and the pushing the pusher up and down, trying to get baby to relax, go to sleep. It works. Now, part of the reason this type of movement works so well on babies is because it reminds them of the movement of being in the mother's womb. And when we were in our mother's womb, every time she moved, every time she was walking, then we were gently swaying. And that happens because of the movement or the rhythm of the pelvis and the legs and the spine. So there's this beautiful rocking sensation that happens when we're in the womb. And this, the idea is, is why babies like to be rocked because it takes them back to that sensation. It's, it's a, then they have this primal relaxation response. You jump onto the reformer, it's exactly the same concept. It's this up and down motion. And I've observed this over many, many years. I used to work with the Robertson Army Barracks in Darwin and they would send their, their injured soldiers to us. So it was called the Soldier Recovery Unit. And these soldiers, these are men and women who have been injured at work to such an extent that they can no longer perform their duties. So they're trying to get out of the army and they're being prepped to move into civilian life. What that looks like for a lot of them is failure. It's scary. They're losing all of the friends that they've ever had in their adult life and they don't have any purpose because when you when you join the army, that is your life. And when you get injured to the point where you can no longer perform your duties in that environment, then you are discarded. Literally, you don't have a name. You, you have a surname. You don't have a, a Christian name. Nobody knows your first name. You have a name and a number, and that's pretty much it. So these people at the lowest of the low, and it's not just with them, but I worked with these people for nine years. They would send their injured service people into the studio three times a week in preparation for them to get out. And basically, they were seeing us at the end of the line. Normally, they would had they would have had multiple surgeries. And I'm pretty sure that the personnel in the army are the ones that trainee surgeons are performing surgery on. You've got to start somewhere, right? But we saw some pretty horrific outcomes with surgeries. There's nothing against surgeons, I know. You've got to start somewhere. And you know what? You sign up for these things. You haven't been forced into the army. But it's very, very sad. So we've seen horrific multiple surgeries quite often because they're surgeries that have gone wrong. So then they get performed over and over again to try and alleviate the wrongdoings. And they're quite often so badly injured that they literally can't do anything. They, they can't do anything in the army. So they're going out to civilian life to a job that they actually don't want to do and that they don't know where they're going to be, what they're going to be doing. What I saw many, many times, we've got, at the time we had three reformers in our clinic studio and all of those guys wanted to be on the reformer. If they didn't want to be on the reformer, just doing footwork, nothing fancy, just going up and down. If they didn't choose to be on the reformer doing that, 
Then they wanted to be on the trap table hung up. How you can put people in traction so you can you can strap up the ankles and then strap up the thighs and have the springs coming from both directions. I think Polestar call it 1990. I just call it active traction. And that, they're laying on their back with their legs in the air. It alleviates tension. It puts all of their joints in traction. But it also gives space to the kidneys and the adrenals. These are just things that I have observed over the years. Now, part of the thing that people keep coming back to with Pilates apart from all those beautiful principles that really do help alleviate stress, is actually the opposite of stress we could call the love hormone. Actually, let's say the self-love hormone, oxytocin. So oxytocin is the hormone that is produced when we are doing something that brings joy to us. So Maybe it's maybe it's exercising. Maybe that does bring joy to you. It doesn't always for people. Maybe it is moving. But it could also be something as simple as being in a room with other people. The statistics of how lonely people are are frightening. And I'm not just talking about elderly people. Adults of all ages are lonely. Children are lonely. It's part of this new online world that we're living in, which has many benefits, but social interaction and communication is not one of them. So oxytocin is produced when we're doing something as a community, which really is what we're designed to do. We're we're very communal beings. We were designed to live in tribes with other people, and we were designed to live in those tribes with a purpose. So you, you would have had your place in the tribe with other people doing an activity to make sure that that tribe not only survived, but that you flourished. Oxytocin is produced when we're patting an animal, if you like animals, of course. So sometimes I take my dog into the studio and I've literally seen people cry with happiness that there's a dog in the studio. It doesn't work for everybody. I realize that and I don't take the dog all the time, but it is definitely food for thought. If you've got a studio pet or a studio animal, studio fuzzy, (laughs) fluffy. Aromatherapy, so things like lavender, chamomile, lang lang can contribute to a relaxing and calming environment and can stimulate oxytocin. So oxytocin is when we feel safe, when we feel comfortable. And, of course, the brain is responding to our environment, which includes what we see, what we smell, and what we hear. So the music that we play in the studio, if you play music, is absolutely key to creating a safe space. So if you've got music blaring, it's something horrible. (laughs) And I know that that's that could be objective. But be very, very careful with the music that you choose because music really does create an environment. So are you trying to up the energy? Are you trying to calm down the nerves? Are you trying to rock the box? (laughs) Choose the music, but don't choose it for you. Choose the music for the people that you are serving. So if I've got more seniors coming in, I'm not going to be playing (laughs) Tay-Tay. I'm going to be playing something that they're familiar with, something that would invoke passion in them, something that would bring back warm memories for them. So sights, smells, and sounds, they really do significantly influence how individuals perceive and respond to our surroundings. So ultimately, our role as Pilates professionals is is always so profound and it always goes way beyond the physical experience of what Pilates offers. And I think that it's really important that we create a space that does invite people in. Now, the way that the brain will work with this is if somebody comes in to see you and they have an experience that they really enjoy, they feel safe, they feel heard or they feel listened to, they they feel like they can trust you, they become familiar with that space, they like the sound, the smell, they like what they're hearing, they like the other people around them, 
Sometimes it's that experience that can actually alleviate the inflammation in the body and help the body heal from an injury. So for example, I had a really, really, really bad back for years and years and years. And I was doing all the things. I was swimming four kilometers a day because I was told that I had to swim. I was doing a hundred sit-ups a day because I was told that I needed to do core exercises. I know. I know Pilates professionals, I've learned it's not about sit-ups. I was riding my bike to and from work because I was told that I should be moving my legs. I was doing a hula hoop at home. I was doing all these things. But I had not found an environment that I felt completely at ease and safe in. So Pilates really was my safe space. I went to my Pilates class and the teacher at the time who actually became my mentor, she she cared about me personally so much. I didn't even have to need, I didn't even need to tell her much. I just knew that she cared sincerely. That is what healed my body because physically I was doing all the things but I hadn't found that safe space. So if you can create that space in your studio or in your home, if you are the one who is stressed out, if you can create a safe space that makes you feel good, really good, get rid of all of the crap around you, get rid of the TV screen, get rid of the phone, get rid of the beeping, get rid of the bloody notifications and just take a moment every single day because remember That excessive stress response of cortisol, that doesn't happen overnight. That happens over a long period of time. Maybe it's weeks, maybe it's months, maybe it's years. But if you do not do things to mitigate that sense of stress in your life, in your client's life, then the ramifications literally will strip you or them of their life. You know what? I could go on about this forever and ever and ever. This is something that I am so passionate about and it's something that I have seen miracles happen in the studio. So I hope that today's episode has just given you a little bit of insight into what stress is, how it can be a real threat or a perceived threat. But as far as the brain and the body is concerned, those two things are the same. How Doing something as simple as laying on your back with your feet in the air can actually help alleviate stress. How doing movement and being mindful of what you're doing in the moment can be a part of your healing process and alleviate stress. That these things need to be done every single day. It doesn't need to be for an hour. It just needs to be consistent. And the more you do it or the more your client does it, the more they will want to do it because it feels good. And if we can educate our clients on these little things that the body absolutely can heal from anything, but first we need to heal from all of that stress or the body cannot completely heal if you're too stressed out, just doesn't happen, then I feel like we can play such an important role in people's lives. And they can then take their Pilates experience with them forever. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Now, I'm going to let you know, I am so passionate about working with people with stress and understanding more about what we can do in the studio that I've actually got a workshop coming up. On the 22nd of March, I'm actually doing a workshop for uh, a group called Movers and Shakers. Movers and Shakers, they're a Melbourne mob in uh, Australia and is put on by Ashley and Rob from Move Mentality, EDU. So I have um, put together a specific reformer workshop for you so that you can learn about things that you can do in the studio when it comes to working with stress. And I'm going to go on and on about some of these aspects of stress but it will I think that it will be an amazing workshop because it's going to put some practicalities to the conversation that I've had with you today if you're not a movement educator or you're not a Pilates instructor and you're not looking at doing a workshop I really do encourage you to jump onto the website thepilatesprofessional.com.au 
and join up the Pilates Muse. The Pilates Muse is a fortnightly publication that reaches out to movement educators but also movement lovers to help you put into application some of the conversations that I have here on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I did not realize that this was going to be such a long one, but I hope I haven't bored the pants off you. And I'll be seeing you or speaking to you next week. Have a wonderful week, my friends. Keep moving and I'll speak to you soon. Now, before I finish up today, I just want to remind you, if you have enjoyed this episode, I would love it if you like and share it with your Pilates professional and movement loving friends so that we can get the word out there and really create a community right here in this hub. Be sure to check out my website, thepilatesprofessional.com.au and have a look if you can find any workshops, which I'm sure you can, that you may be needing right now. Remember, I also do a six-month reformer teacher training mentor program. I call it a mentor program because I literally personally mentor each student through their own program until they are ready to teach reformer. It's what I specialize in. And I think that this is one of the biggest missing links in our industry right now is that we have these wonderful diploma level training workshops that people can do to become very comprehensively trained in Pilates. But when it comes to reformer, it's so wishy-washy out there that you could become an instructor online with no personal access to a mentor ever, or you could become a reformer instructor as a stepping stone to diploma level training. So where I come into it is I just do reformer teacher training that is recognized and recommended by the Pilates Association of Australia, which means that my students then become members of PAA. It's super important for our industry and it's what our students deserve. So if you know somebody who is looking to become a reformer teacher, then this is where you want to send them, thepilatesprofessional.com.au. They can reach out to me. I can have a call with them and see if I have a program that is coming up that is suitable for them. And or I also do a host of online workshops for you to expand your repertoire and your understanding specifically of the Pilates work. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to you listening to the next episode next week. I'm Katie Crane, the Pilates Professional.